Dive into God's Word. Dig a little deeper. Discover the Bible's message for you today. Pathway to Paradise Ministries presents Deeper, your daily Bible study with Dr. Tim Rumsey and Pastor David Salazar. Good morning and thank you for joining us today. You're listening to Deeper, your daily Bible study. Today is Tuesday, March 26. Our topic is the millennium in Revelation chapter 20. My name is Tim Rumsey. Pastor David Salazar is joining me uh, over the internet from his warm home in Florida. It's about 12 degrees out here in Missouri this morning. Uh, So we're thankful for uh, a house that can keep us warm. Amen. But let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll dive into our lesson. Father in heaven, Thank you for your blessings to us today as we take another glimpse at what you have revealed to us. May we grow in our love and appreciation and trust of you and in our commitment to follow you and serve you. Amen. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, David, a very interesting and important chapter here in Revelation chapter 20. We have 13 minutes and two seconds uh, (laughs) to cover this. So we're going to have to do some summarizing, but we will try to focus on uh, some of the important aspects here. In uh, the beginning of Revelation 20, we read this, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. Uh, And I'll hit the pause button right there for a moment. Uh, David, here we have a reference to the thousand years, which is often also called the millennium. Mm -hmm. And it's important for us to understand when this time period begins uh, and where the righteous are and where the lost are at this point. Right. This becomes clearer as we read through the chapter. But for time's sake, uh, could you just summarize for us when does this start and what is the setting? Well, the thousand years that is mentioned here starts at the end second coming of Christ. We know that the Lord Jesus Christ comes back to earth to take his redeemed and those that were saved who believe in his name back with him to heaven. And while the earth is being left in a desolate state, we see and we know from this, from, from the word of God that the wicked, those that have rejected the Lord, who are not ready for his coming, they are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. So they are destroyed almost, I guess, instantly or, or they're destroyed or, or killed. But they have just received that first death. And so uh, the, the, the redeemed are separated, are taken up to heaven. And we go back to heaven for a thousand years. And that's really what happens. And uh, in this verse, it mentions clearly that Satan and his angel, but Satan is ultimately, he is bound to this earth for a thousand years. That's right. And then verse three uh, tells us that at the end of the thousand years, he will be loosed for a little season. And as we read further in Revelation chapter 20, we find that sure enough, all of the uh, lost, the the wicked are resurrected at the second resurrection. And for a a last short amount of time, Satan is able to uh, unite them in opposition against God. And in this sense, then, he is loosed from his his chains that have bound him. You know, he's out of a job during these thousand years. <laughs> Imagine that. The only thing he's done for thousands of years uh, is to tempt and deceive and annoy and, and persecute. Now he's left essentially to sit on a rock and think about what he's done. And, and at the same time, uh, Tim, the, the earth is, is in a state of desolation. There is no life in, on sure. earth. There is nothing, you know, where he can be amused by. There's no animals. There's no living thing. The earth stays in a, in a state of, of desolation, and it's, it's also a rest, a rest of sin that God gives the earth, the planet earth. So it becomes a prison to Satan, but he has a long time to think about all that he did in, dece- in deceiving the world. That's right. Well, let's turn our attention now to what is taking place in heaven. And David, would you, would you read verse 4 for Absolutely. us? Absolutely. <clears throat> and I saw thrones. This is, again, after you mentioned... Uh, the, the redeem are going to heaven. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshiped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. 
and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. What a beautiful verse. Absolutely. And uh, there is a lot going on in heaven during this, this thousand years. There is a judgment that is taking place. Mm-hmm. They live and reign with Christ a thousand years. And uh, we're going to dwell on this uh, for a bit here because we need to understand what is happening in heaven at this time. It's not just a um, vacation. Certainly, it's it's a uh, release from the oppression of what God's people have been going through on earth. But something critically important is taking place in heaven during this thousand years. And we get some idea of how important it is by the very fact that it does take a thousand years to go through this process. Right. Uh, and Tim, let me, if I can just really just mention this point. <clears throat> some people, uh, some Protestant, you know, uh, and, and maybe those that don't really uh, understand the concept of how the, or the phases of the judgment, they think sometimes that this is just when the judgment starts, but this is not the investigative judgment. This is not the judgment that uh, of God starting. Uh, it's not a phase of, you know, finding out who's holy or who's who's worthy to be in, with God. That has already have been decided. This is a judgment of right. of being, uh, you know, trying to examine how the judgment was made. Perhaps you know, it's opportunity for the for these people, for those redeemed, to be able to uh, analyze how the Lord did the investigative judgment. Uh, it, it's that that experience really, and and, and I guess. We're going to find more from the Word of God, but just going to throw that is not, you know, the, when the judgment starts, if if some of you hear this from, um, you know, preachers out there or whatnot, they don't understand and they have been uh, misled by believing this is the beginning of the judgment. That's right. And we don't really have time to talk too much about all the phases of the judgment, but the Bible is clear that there is more than one phase to the judgment. There's the the judgment that takes place before the second coming. That is the time period we live in. Then there's this thousand years of judgment, which takes place in heaven. And then at the end of Revelation 20, there's a final uh, executive judgment, uh, which is also known as hell. And that is when sin is finally destroyed. Mm -hmm. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 2, we read this. Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Verse 3 goes on. Know you not that we shall judge Mm -hmm. angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? So even Paul uh, indicated that uh, the time would come when God's redeemed people would be involved in a very important judgment of some sort. Mm -hmm. Uh, David, I don't know if you've turned to 1 Corinthians while I was reading that. Well, I did. (laughs) Um, You did. Fantastic. Fantastic. Uh, if you would read for us 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse number 5, and this gives us a better idea of just what um, the purpose of this judgment is in heaven during the thousand years. 1 Corinthians 4, verse 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts, and then shall every man have praise of God. Very important verse, David. Absolutely. Um, it kind of clears you the, the mind why this, this judgment of a thousand years is important and it has to happen. That's right. You know, uh, at the time of the second coming, uh, resurrection of the righteous, saints going to heaven, there are still going to be some unanswered questions, many unanswered questions right. in the hearts of those that uh, are saved. You know, and, and God forbid that yeah, you make it to heaven and you look around and your family's not there. Mm. Or the, you know that favorite pastor you had that was such a great encouragement and spoke wonderful sermons. Mm. He's not there. Mercy. On the flip side, that neighbor who always blew leaves uh, purposely into your lawn, <laughs> he is, and he's still your neighbor in heaven. You know, what's going on? And these are kind of frivolous uh, examples, some of them, but you know, there's some more serious aspects to right. this. And the question is, underlying it, is God fair? Is he just? Can we really trust him? Hmm. And so the, the question that needs to be addressed and answered for the thousand years is, who truly is God? Is his character what he claims it to be? Mm-hmm. And 
that is such a critical thing in God's sight for us to understand and to be comfortable with. Absolutely. That he <clears throat> allows a thousand years for these questions uh, to be answered. And and also... And I don't know, right. David. I was going to say that... that sorry. <laughs> I was going to say that uh, I, I feel that, you know, it's it's so important, as you mentioned, the the concept of being able to answer the questions uh, you think of a mother who, who, you know, has prayed for his children and, uh, for her children and, and they are <clears throat> there, they're not there or, or that love, you know, one that you really, even now when they went to rest, you have that hope in your heart that, you know, and that, that's the blessed hope you have that they lie in, in Christ. Yet somehow when you get there, they're not there. Uh, this, even though you believe and you know that God is fair, the, God has to make sure that it clears out any doubt, any question in the mind, because it really, it, it boils down to the securing heaven for, and, and well, not the heaven, the universe for eternity. You know, there has to be no question in anyone's mind that God has been perfect and righteous and just, and that everyone that is not there, um, you know, there's a reason and, and, and it's clearly understood and seen by the world. And that's why this verse, uh, which is read in, in verse Corinthians 4, clearly states that the hidden things will be manifested, that were made in darkness, you know, and the counsel of the heart, you know, we will be able to see, you know, what we could not see when we we're in, on, on, on earth. And that's why he says that every man shall praise God. We will be saying, righteous are your judgments. You were right. There is no way that this person that I loved could could really be here because they did not really believe, trusted, and gave their hearts to you. You know, they would have the whole universe would have been in jeopardy if they if they could have been here on earth. I mean on 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 heaven. So that is why I you know it's so important and, and paramount for God to to put this put himself in judgment, if you will, you know, for a thousand years. That's right. That's right. And you know I I I said that these are frivolous examples. They're not, except maybe the neighbor <laughs> example was. Yeah. But Think about the prophet Isaiah. Uh, mm. You know, Manasseh. He was martyred yeah. by King Manasseh, mm -hmm. and the last thing that Isaiah knew was that this king was ordering uh, him. We think that he was probably put into a hollow log and then cut in right. half. The last thing Isaiah knows is that King Manasseh has ordered this, and maybe standing right there as it happens. And that the next thing Isaiah knows, uh, he is resurrected at the second coming, and there. Mm. Uh, is is king because he had a, a reformation in his right. life after this martyrdom of Isaiah. Right. Those kind of questions must be answered before God's kingdom is ultimately secure. Absolutely. And that we can trust that he is just and fair. Amen. And because of this, God can promise again in, in Nahum 1 verse 9 that sin will never rise up. The curse will never come again mm, amen. the second time. Amen. And this is a sovereign thought, Tim, that, you know, we have to realize, am I keeping in my heart hidden sins? Am I, you know, am I being a, a deception to my family even, to myself? And, and you know, I believe this is, this, is, this is a sovereign thought that we have to today come clean before the Lord, surrender our wills completely to him. So that he may come into our lives, transform us, change us, and may his gospel become powerful in us to overcome sin in our lives. So anyway, that's just a, a thought, a, a final thought I wanted to give in, in this moment. Yeah, thank you. Well, tomorrow we will begin looking at the uh, new Jerusalem and heaven and the end of all things here. Really the beginning, <laughs> the beginning uh, of all things. But uh, a fantastic and fascinating, beautiful picture we'll see there. We are out of time for today. I hope that you've been blessed by the time spent in God's Word. It certainly is for us each day. And just want to uh, ask you, if you're enjoying these studies, please let us know. You can send an email, fill out our contact form, and uh, we'll look forward to hearing from you. God bless. We'll see you tomorrow. Deeper is a production of Pathway to Paradise Ministries. For more Bible study resources, including books, DVDs, and study guides, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. 
To support this ministry with your tax-deductible contribution, visit pathwaytoparadise.org or call toll-free 855-HIS-TRUTH. That's 855-447-8788.